Bedtime Tales by Enid Blyton. Our first story is called Jigsaw Joe. You ought to be called Jigsaw Joan, said George scornfully, when Joan began to do yet another jigsaw. Well, if I like doing jigsaws, why shouldn't I do them? said Joan. You like collecting stamps, and Ronnie likes making things with his Meccano. I don't laugh at you for doing those things whenever you can. But you always take up all the table with your silly jigsaws, said Ronnie. You go on and on. I can't think what you can see in them. And I can't think what George sees in his silly stamps. All you see in your endless Meccano, said Joan, beginning to be cross. Can't you see that some people like doing one thing and some people another? I'm good at doing jigsaws. You're good at doing something else. I don't see why we can't all be happy in our own way. Well, collecting stamps teaches you geography, so it's some use. And making things with Meccano teaches you to be clever with your hands, said Ronnie. Doing jigsaws simply doesn't teach you anything. I'll do them just for pleasure then, said Joan, emptying out a box of coloured jigsaw pieces. And you never know, you might be glad some day that I'm so clever at fitting jigsaws together. We shan't, Jigsaw Joan, said George. And remember this, when our birthday comes next week, don't give us jigsaws, we don't like them. Hmm, I'm not going to, said Joan. I've got your presents already. George's birthday and Ronnie's came very near together, only two days between. So they always shared it and made one big day of it between them. Joan didn't give them jigsaws, of course. She gave George a new stamp album, and Ronnie a book showing him all kinds of different things he could build. They were both very pleased. Oh, we've been lucky, they said. We've had ships, trains, books, and a pound note between us. Fifty p each, said George. Lovely, we're rich. Put the note in your money box, said their mother. But they forgot and left it on the window sill. The wind came and blew it away. It blew it inside the room and over to the toy cupboard. It blew it right inside at the very, very back. So, of course, when the two boys looked for it, it was gone. They couldn't find it anywhere. They didn't think of looking at the back of the toy cupboard. They were very sad, but it couldn't be helped. The pound note had gone. Now a little mouse ran in and out of the toy cupboard each night. It came the night the paper money had blown to the back of the toy cupboard. It was very pleased to find it there, because it meant to make a paper nest. This paper would do nicely. It could bite it up into little pieces and make a cosy little nest in the little toy motor car. So it chewed up the note into about seventy pieces and made a nest of it. But before any babies came into the nest, the children's mother turned out the toy cupboard, and she found the mouse's nest in the toy motor car. She called to the children. Joan, George, Ronnie, do come and see. A little mouse has made a nest in your toy motor car. They came to look. George gave a cry. Oh, mother, look what the nest is made of. Our pound note, all bitten into tiny pieces. It's wasted, said Ronnie. We can't spend it now. Oh, what a pity. Joan emptied the tiny bits carefully onto a little tray. She looked at them. It's rather like a little paper jigsaw, she said. If only I could fit all the little paper bits together properly and put some sticky paper behind the pound note, it would be whole again and you might be allowed to spend it. 
Oh, Joan, could you do it? cried George and Ronnie. Begin now, quickly. So Joan's deft fingers sorted out the tiny paper bits. She borrowed a new pound note from Mother to see how it looked, and then she began to do a peculiar jigsaw. A bit here and a bit there. That bit fits there, surely, and that one should go there. Here's a straight bit, and here's another. It's coming! It's coming! cried George, and so it was. It took Joan nearly the whole day to fit the many little bits together and to stick them carefully at the back so that the note showed up whole. You're very patient and deft and very clever, Jigsaw Joan, said Mother admiringly. But I don't think anyone would take the note. We'd better go and ask the man at the bank what he thinks. Well, the man at the bank was very surprised to see such a peculiar note. But he said yes, it was quite all right. He would give each of the boys 50p for it. What do you think of that? We'll never tease you again, Joan, never, said George. You're the cleverest sister in the world. Come and spend our money with us. They spent it all, and 25p of it was spent on, well, I'll give you a guess. Yes, you're right. It was spent on a new jigsaw for Joan. She's going to do it tonight, and you may be sure she will get every single piece into its right place before she goes to bed. Clever jigsaw, Joan. And our next story is called Michael's New Belt. Michael was very proud of his new leather belt. It had little brass studs on it halfway round and a rather grand buckle. See my belt, he said to the other boys. My uncle gave me that. He brought it back from Canada with him. I guess this is the kind of belt that cowboys wear on a ranch over there. The other boys thought it was fine. They fingered it and patted the brass studs. Cool, wish I had one like that, said William, the head of the class. Michael was very proud to hear him say that. Michael was very careful of his new belt. He didn't wear it every day. He kept it for Sundays, or for the days he went to see his granny or his aunts. Then he would buckle the new belt round his shorts, with the brass studs and buckles shining brightly, and set off proudly. One day he went to see his granny. He stayed to dinner with her, and then set off to walk home. He had on his new belt, of course, and granny had admired it for the twentieth time. I suppose you wouldn't lend it to me to wear when I go to London next week, she said solemnly. Michael laughed. Oh, Granny, you wouldn't want to wear a belt like mine. You know you wouldn't. But I would lend it to you if you really wanted it. I wouldn't lend it to any boy or girl, though. It's much too precious. He went off home with two little ginger cakes Granny had baked for his tea, and on the way home he heard someone shouting so loudly that he stopped in surprise. Who was shouting? Michael was in the fields and he couldn't see anyone about at all. The shouting went on and on. Help! Help me! Can't you see me? I'm up here! Up here! Up the tree! Then Michael looked up, and there, a good way up a tall tree on the other side of the hedge, he saw a boy. The tree was bare, and Michael could see him easily. He stared in surprise. I say, help me, won't you? yelled the boy. Why, what's the matter? Can't you climb down? yelled back Michael, 
going nearer to the tree. No, I've got stuck somehow, and now I'm frightened, said the boy, sounding almost as if he were going to cry. Why did you climb so high? called Michael. There's a bull in this field, and he ran at me, shouted back the boy. I just had time to chin up this tree, and I can tell you I climbed faster than I've ever climbed in all my life, and now I'm stuck, and I'm awfully afraid of falling. I feel giddy. I'll come and help you down, said Michael. He kept a lookout for the bull, which didn't seem anywhere to be seen, and then began to climb up the tree. He soon reached the boy. Look, can't you put your foot down to this branch? He said to the boy. What's your name? I don't seem to have seen you before. I'm Robert Trent, said the boy. No, I can't put my foot down to the branch. I tell you, I'm scared. I think I'm going to be sick. Michael looked at him. He did look rather green. You're not really afraid of falling, are you? He said anxiously. Here, hold on to me till you feel a bit better. The boy wouldn't even hold on to Michael. He wouldn't let go his hold of the branch he was on. Isn't there a ladder I can get down by? He said desperately. Surely there's one at the farm. I know I shall fall soon. I'll go and run to the farm for help, said Michael, beginning to climb down again. But the boy cried out at once, No, don't leave me. I shall fall down the tree if you do. I know I shall. Stay with me. But that's silly, said Michael sensibly. How can I possibly go and get help if you won't let me leave you? I don't know, said the boy, looking greener than ever. Oh, I do feel awful. I daren't even open my eyes now, because I know I shall feel giddy if I do. Michael looked down the tree. It was a long, long way to fall. He began to feel frightened for the boy. Suppose he did fall. He might be killed, or at least break a leg or an arm. The boy spoke again, his eyes still shut. Have you got a rope, by any chance, so that you could tie me to this branch? If you could do that, I'd feel safer, and I'd let you go and, and fetch help. No, I haven't got a rope, said Michael. And then a thought struck him. He hadn't a rope, but he had got a fine, strong leather belt. He looked down at his belt. He didn't want to lend it to anyone, not even to Robert. It would probably be rubbed against the tree. Some of the brass studs might come out. No, he couldn't think of lending it to this foolish boy. But Michael was a kindly boy, and he didn't go on thinking like this for long. He suddenly unbuckled his belt and slipped it off his shorts. I'll buckle you to the branch with my belt, he said. That'll keep you safe. It's a very good, strong leather belt. But the belt wasn't long enough to buckle the boy to a branch. So Michael did the next best thing. He buckled the belt loosely to a nearby bough and told Robert to slip his arm through it. Then he tightened the belt over the boy's arm. There, he said. Now, even if you feel yourself falling, my belt will hold you up. You needn't be afraid any more. Oh, that's a wonderful idea, said the boy, gratefully. I feel better already. Thanks very much. I'll go down now and get a ladder or something, said Michael. And he shinned quickly down the tree, glad that he had a better head than Robert for climbing. He ran off towards the farm. It was a long time before he could find anyone to help him. The farmer and his wife were at market. The men were at work in different places. At last, Michael found one who listened to his tale. What? A boy up a tree and can't get down? said the man. 
What sort of a boy is that? He's not worth bothering him with. But I know he'll fall if he doesn't get help, said Michael. Where's a ladder? Can I borrow one? No. A youngster like you can't carry a great heavy ladder to put halfway up a tree, said the man. Wait till I finish this job and I'll go myself. So Michael had to wait impatiently till the man finished his work. Then, not hurrying himself at all, he went with Michael to the tree in the field where the bull was. But Robert wasn't there. He had gone. Well, this is the tree, said Michael. But the boy's gone. How strange. Look here, said the man. Did you make this all up, just to play a trick? Because if you did, I'll... No, I didn't, really, said Michael hurriedly. Please believe me. I even lent the boy my best leather belt to hang on to and tied up my shorts with a bit of string. Look! Well, you won't see your leather belt any more, that's certain, said the man and went off. Michael stood there alone, feeling very upset. Was the man right? Had he really lost his belt for good? He saw a man in the field leading a bull with a stick, which he had fastened to a ring at the end of the bull's nose. He called to him. I say, did you see a boy up a tree here, frightened of falling? Yes, I saw him when I came to get the bull, shouted back the man. Silly youngster, climbing so high when he's scared of falling. I got him down all right. Where did he go? asked Michael. Did he say anything about a leather belt I lent him? No, he didn't, said the man. He fastened one round his waist. Oh, a beauty it was. And off he went over the hill. Just said, thanks very much, and went. Oh, said Michael. He was upset and disappointed. He had helped the boy and all the return he had got was to lose his belt and not have a single word of thanks. He went home and told his mother all about it. If I meet that boy again, I'll fight him, he said. He might at least have waited under the tree till I came back and given me my belt, my beautiful belt. Mother, I'll never lend anyone my belt again. I won't lend anyone anything again. I won't even help people in trouble. Now, that's not like you, Michael, said his mother. You mustn't think evil of people until you're certain they've done something wrong or unkind. And how foolish to change yourself from a kind, generous boy into an unkind, selfish one just because someone has behaved badly to you. Oh, well, I expect you're right as usual, Mother, said Michael. I'll be sensible. But you don't know how upset I am about my belt. Now, a week after that, Michael went shopping in the next town with his mother. As he was walking down the road, a car suddenly stopped just by him and a head peeped out. A voice called excitedly, I say, I say, aren't you the boy who lent me your lovely belt up that tree? And there was Robert looking out of the car window. Michael nodded, looking rather surly. The boy got out of the car and ran to him. A man got me down from the tree after you'd gone. I put on your belt to keep it safe, and then I went off to look for you. But I lost my way and never found you. And ever since I've worried and worried, as I was afraid you'd think I'd gone off with it and never meant to give it back. A man looked out of the car. Is this the boy who helped Robert? He said. Oh, we've been making inquiries for him all over the place. 
Thank you, Sonny, for doing your best for him. He's an idiot to climb trees. He always feels giddy. Here's your pelt, said Robert, taking a parcel out of the car. I've carried it about with me ever since last week, hoping I'd see you somewhere. Dad, can we take him to the circus with us? Can he come now? Well, we must ask his mother, said Robert's father. You can guess what Michael's mother said. Of course he can come, she said. Do you mean now, this very minute? Oh, what a surprise for you, Michael. It certainly was. In a trice, he was in the car sitting beside Robert, speeding off to the circus. And oh, what a wonderful time he had. And now, of course, Robert and Michael are quite inseparable. In fact, Michael's mother says she never sees one without the other. And will you believe it? Michael lends his belt to Robert whenever he asks him to. When the music stops, turn your cassette over. Our next story is about a little girl with the strange name of Interfering Ina. I wonder if you ever knew Interfering Ina. She was a little girl, about eight years old. Quite pretty, quite clever. But oh dear, how she did interfere with all the other children. If she saw two or three of them playing a game together, she would go and poke her nose into the game and say, Oh, you're not playing that quite right. Look, you should play it this way. And then she would make the children play quite a different way, a way they didn't want to play at all. Don't interfere, they would say at last. Go away, Ina. Well, I only wanted to put you right, Ina would say and then off she would go in a huff. If she saw a little girl sewing, she would go at once to see what she was doing. Then she would say, Oh, you're making an overall for your doll, I see. Well, you're doing it wrong. You should sew it like this. And she would take the sewing from the little girl's hand and make her sew it quite differently. It was so tiresome of Ina. The other children got very tired of her. Here comes interfering Ina, they would say, as soon as they saw her coming. Hello, Ina. Are you going to poke your nose into our games again? Well, go away. But do you suppose that cured Ina of her tiresome ways? Not a bit. She simply loved to interfere with everything, and she was so curious about everybody and what they were doing that she was forever poking her nose here, there and everywhere. Now one day she was walking home alone from school. The other children wouldn't walk with her because she had interfered in a fine new game they'd made up that morning and had spoilt it for them. So there was Ina walking home by herself, feeling very cross indeed. She came to a field and heard somebody laughing. It was such a funny high little laugh that Ina stopped to see who it could be. She climbed on the gate and peeped into the field. And there she saw a most surprising sight. She saw four little brownie men playing leapfrog. They were having a fine game and were shouting and laughing in little bird-like voices. Ina watched them for a while and then she called to them. You know, that's not the right way to play leapfrog. 
You want to bend down with your back to the others, not with your front. Look, I'll show you. She climbed over the gate and jumped down into the field. She ran to the surprised brownies. She took hold of one of them and bent him down. He stood up again, angrily. How dare you push me about, he cried, in a voice like a thrush's, high and clear. Go away, you interfering little girl. But I'm only trying to show you how to play leapfrog properly, said Ina crossly. Bend down. She tried to bend the brownie over again, but he pushed her away and slapped her fingers. We play leapfrog the brownie way, not your way, he said. Brothers, who's this Bad-mannered child. One of the brownies looked closely at Ina. Then he laughed. Ha! Huh, I've heard of her, he said. It's interfering Ina. She pokes her silly little nose into everything and makes herself such a nuisance. Oh, she does, does she? said the first brownie, glaring at Ina. Well, if time she interferes in future and pushes her nose into other people's business, her nose will get longer. <laughs> that will be funny. He jumped high into the air, turning head over heels and sprang right over the hedge. The others followed and Ina was left alone in the field, a little frightened and very cross. She went home. Silly little fellows, she said feeling her pretty little nose, as if anything they said would come true. She had her dinner, and then she went out to play in the garden. She heard the little boy next door talking to his rabbit as he cleaned out its hutch. Ina stood on a box and looked over the wall. Gimme, she said. You shouldn't clean out your hutch that way. You should have the clean hay ready before you take out the old hay. You should... Jimmy stared up at her, and then he stared again. Something funny had happened to Ina's nice little nose. It had grown quite an inch longer. Oh, what have you done to your nose, Ina? asked Jimmy in surprise. Oh, it does look funny. Ina felt her nose in alarm. <gasps> Gracious! did feel long. She rushed indoors and looked at herself in the glass. Yes, it, it had grown a whole inch longer, and her face looked queer with such a long nose. Ina was ashamed and frightened. I shall have to say I bumped it and it swelled, said the little girl to herself. She did not usually tell stories, but she felt too ashamed to say that it had grown long because she had interfered. So when she went to school that afternoon and the other children asked her what had happened to her nose, she told them a story. I bumped it and it swelled, she said. Hmm, funny sort of swelling, said John. It isn't really big, it's just long. Ina forgot about her nose after a bit, for there came a handwork lesson which she loved. The children were making toys. Ina looked at the little boy next to her. What are you making? she said. I'm making an engine, he said. Pugh, that's not the way to make an engine, said Ina scornfully. Give it to me. Look, you should put the funnel here. She pressed so hard on the funnel that it broke. Oh, you interferer, said the little boy, almost in tears, for he'd been very proud of his engine. Oh, what's happened to your nose, Ina? What, indeed? It had grown quite two inches longer in that moment, and now it looked horrid. Ina was quite ugly. The children shouted with laughter. <laughs> Ina's nose is getting longer and longer, so that she can poke it into other people's business very easily, said Joan. Well, before the day was ended, Ina's nose was six inches long. 
imagine it. It stuck out from her face and made her look very strange indeed. Her mother was simply horrified when she saw it. Ina, what have you done with your nose? Nothing, said Ina sulkily. It was no use saying that she'd bumped it, because Mummy simply wouldn't believe her. But something's happened to it, something horrid, said her mother. I must take you to the doctor. So Ina went to the doctor, and first he laughed when he saw her nose, and then he looked grave, and last of all, he looked puzzled. Hmm. I've never seen such a nose, he said. How did she get it? She won't tell me, said Ina's mother. Then Ina began to cry, and she told all that had happened, how she'd interfered with the brownies, and they had said her nose would grow bigger every time she stuck it into somebody else's business. Mm, dear me, said the doctor in surprise. So that's what's happened. Well, I'm afraid I can't do anything about it. But can't you tell us how to, to cure her nose? asked Ina's mother, beginning to cry too. She was such a pretty girl, and now she's so ugly. Well, well, I can only say that perhaps if she stops interfering with other people, her nose may go back to its right size, said the doctor. But it rests with Ina herself. Poor child. They went home. The mother very sad and upset. So was poor Ina. Now listen, Ina, said her mother. We can't have your nose growing any longer, can we? Well, you must stop poking it into things that don't concern you. You mustn't interfere any more. You'd better ask the other children to help you. All right, Mummy. I will, said Ina, and she went out to find her friends. She told them what the doctor had said. So please, will you all help me? She begged. If I come and interfere, stop me at once, because if you don't, my nose will grow down to my toes and maybe I'll have to tie a knot in it to stop myself from tripping over it. We'll help you, Ina, said the children kindly. Children are always kind when they see someone in trouble, and these children couldn't bear to see Ina crying tears all down her long nose. They'd often been cross with her, but now they only wanted to help her. So the next few days, you should have seen what happened. Every time Ina came to interfere or to poke her nose into something that was nothing to do with her, they spoke at once. Ina! Remember, don't interfere. Then Ina would go red and say, Sorry, I nearly forgot. In a week's time, her nose was almost the right size again, and soon it would be the same pretty little nose she had before. But goodness knows how long the magic will last. She'll have to be careful all her life not to interfere, just in case her nose shoots out again. Poor Ina. She still looks a bit queer, but I hope that next time I see her, she'll look her old, pretty little self. And in this next story, we meet Cross Aunt Tabitha. Tabitha was a very strict old lady. When her nieces went to stay with her, they were very careful how they behaved. They said please and thank you when they should, and they always opened the door for Aunt Tabitha and fetched her footstool as soon as she sat in her chair. When Phyllis and Jane went to stay with her, they felt rather frightened. They did hope they would do everything they should, they meant to try very hard. But Phyllis was rather a noisy child and banged doors behind her. So Aunt Tabitha was cross and spoke sharply. 
And then Jane upset her tea all over the clean tablecloth, and that made Aunt Tabitha cross too. They went to bed the first night feeling rather upset. <sighs> oh, I hope Aunt Tabitha isn't going to be cross all the time, said Phyllis. I shall go home if she is, said Jane. I don't like her. Well, we'll see what happens tomorrow, said Phyllis. I shall try my hardest not to bang doors. She didn't bang a door, but she forgot to wipe her feet on the mat and brought mud in all over the blue hall carpet. Aunt Tabitha frowned when she saw it. Get the dustpan and brush and sweep up the mud as soon as it's dry, she said. And then Jane knocked against a little table, upset a glass vase, and down it went with a crash. It broke into about a hundred pieces. Aunt Tabitha was very angry. If you are clumsy again, I shall send you up to bed, she said. Poor Phyllis and Jane. It was really very difficult for them to be sweet and smiling to someone who scolded them so hard. But they knew that Aunt Tabitha was old, and Mother had said that old people were not as patient as younger ones. She's nice when she smiles, said Phyllis. Oh, but I wish she'd smile more often. I think we'll go home, said Jane, who was rather afraid of being sent to bed if she did anything to displease her aunt. I'll pack her bag. We can slip out of the house and, and go home without anyone knowing. Just then, the maid came in, looking very pale. Please, Miss Phyllis and Miss Jane, she said. I feel ill. Do you think you can manage to get your aunt's tea if I leave it ready? Oh, of course, said Jane at once. Go and lie down, Mary. Oh, you do look ill. We can manage. I meant to finish turning out your aunt's little sewing room, said Mary. I'm in the middle of it now, but I feel so queer. I, I really think I'd better leave it till tomorrow. The maid went to her room. The two girls looked at one another. We can't slip home now, said Jane. It would be mean. We must stay and help. Do you think we'd better try and finish turning out Aunt Tabitha's sewing room? said Phyllis. It would be kind to Mary to do it, and Aunt Tabitha does hate to see a room upside down. Let's do it. So the two girls got dusters, brooms and mops, and went to finish turning out the sewing room. Aunt Tabitha was having a nap in the drawing room and didn't know what they were doing at all. The room was upside down, for Mary had been in the middle of turning it out. The girls swept the ceiling free of cobwebs. They swept the carpets. They polished the boards. Then they wondered if they ought to take the chair cushions into the garden and beat them to get rid of the dust. Well, we might as well be thorough, said Jane. Oh, look, the seat of this chair comes out. Shall we take it right out and, and dust underneath properly? Yes, said Phyllis. Come on, tug. The seat of the chair, which was an enormous velvet cushion, came out with a jerk. The girls were just going to take it downstairs to beat, when Jane caught sight of something deep down in the under seat of the chair. She put her hand down and pulled it out. It was a flat leather case. She opened it and gave a loud cry. <gasps> Phyllis, this case is full of paper money. Look, five pound notes and, and ten pound notes. Good gracious, who do you suppose it belongs to? <sighs> I can't imagine. We'll tell Aunt Tabitha at tea time and see what she says, said Phyllis, excited. I daren't wake her now. Come on, let's finish our job. Put the case somewhere, somewhere safe, till tea time. 
At tea time, the two girls took in the tea tray most carefully. Phyllis had made the tea and had filled the hot water jug. The bread and butter was already cut. The cake Jane had taken out of the tin and put on a plate. Dear me, where's Mary? asked Aunt Tabitha in surprise when the girls came in with the tea things. She's not feeling well, said Jane, so she's lying down for a little while. She was in the middle of turning out your little sewing room, Aunt Tabitha, and we thought we'd finish it for her. We took the big seat out of the old armchair there to beat the dust from it, and right down under the seat we found this. Jane gave her aunt the leather case. Aunt Tabitha stared at it in the greatest amazement and delight. My lost note case, she cried. Oh, to think it's found again. There are a hundred pounds in it. I lost it nearly two years ago and hunted for it everywhere. Well, well, well. Oh, Aunt Tabitha, I am pleased for you cried Phyllis. I know how horrid it is to lose things and how lovely to find them again. I do think you're good children to finish turning out the sewing room, said Aunt Tabitha. And to think you were thorough enough to take the cushion seat out of the chair to beat. Well, well. I thought you were rather careless children, but I'm sorry I thought that now. I think you're good and helpful children, and I'm pleased with you. Phyllis and Jane went red with pleasure. They each thought how nearly they'd slipped away and gone home, but they didn't want to tell Aunt Tabitha that. Instead, they sat and ate a good tea, and had two slices of cake each, because Aunt Tabitha was so pleased with them. And the next day... Their aunt took them shopping. She bought a big baby doll for Jane, with eyes that opened and shut, and a doll's house for Phyllis, with real electric lights in the rooms. It was marvellous. That's your share of the hundred pounds you found, said Aunt Tabitha. Nice children. Good children. Mm, I'm glad you're staying with me. Mm, we're glad too, said Jane, and she hugged her aunt hard. And dear me, wasn't it a good thing they didn't run away the day before? You never know how things are going to turn out, do you? It's always best to go on trying, no matter what happens. Mm -hmm.